Hi, this is the uh, 30th bite size to uh, promote uh, your research, number 30, and this one's called Alt Metrics. My name is Andy Tattersall. This is a, an abridged uh, presentation that was done from a two hour workshop that myself and Claire Beecroft both ran. Uh, our names are on the screen and also our Twitter uh, tags if you want to if you want to contact us via Twitter. Uh, and this one is on alt metrics. So starting off with alt metrics, uh, these are various based tools that will help you um, improve your scholarly output, get your kind of scholarly content out there. They're, they're pretty much regarded as metrics to actually measure scholarly uh, output and, and, and content. But we also kind of believe that they're very useful tools to promote your your research and your output and your content. And there's lots of things out there. We're thinking particularly social media, visual tools, uh, web 2.0 tools etc starting off with one of the biggest the one that gets talked about a lot especially uh, regarding footballers and politicians and cricketers etc Twitter so why should you tweet is the big question well Twitter allows you to do a lot of things it's not just about talking about what you had for your tea or following the latest celebrity there are a lot of people out there using it professionally um, a lot of academics are using it particularly in the information and library world but increasingly there are more in different disciplines starting to use this as a way to share and to communicate it's a two-way process it's a way of communicating with people that not necessarily you see on a day-to-day -day basis or operate in your circles and certainly communicate with people globally it allows you to kind of capture information you can go to a conference use a Twitter hashtag and use that as a way to capture the whole kind of feeling of the conference in one stream of, uh, of, of, of conscious debate and, and, and expression you can use it to learn about things stay abreast of people who know a lot more about you than you may do on a certain topic or a certain theme and you can use this to collect uh, collect the kind of um, knowledge of the crowd the wisdom of the crowd so if there's a group of people out there that are talking about things that you're interested in you can use them to stay abreast of that content you can use it to share share ideas and share various various themes and, and, and things that you may want to do you can use it as an archive you can save tweets there are various ways out there that allow you to archive them uh, use it to follow people and to promote promote your ideas express your ideas get them out there a few little pieces of evidence um, it's not just one-way traffic people uh, can communicate various things. Claire was at a conference, Health Libraries Group conference last year, and I retweeted a tweet of hers regarding Turning Point Software. The same day, Turning Tech, who sell Turning Point Software, start to follow me. So you start to realise people are looking out there for conversations. Uh, Claire has a conversation um, at a fellow delegate at HLG, and then approaches the delegate. She uses it as an icebreaker. So they've already had a communication without actually being in person it allows that kind of breakdown of, of, of boundaries um, I had a problem with my Quidco account and with Quidco you can't contact them via email or telephone but you can tweet at them and they will reply the same day and it resolved my problem Brian Kelly who's from the University of Bath was at a conference I attended uh, last year and um, Brian talked about Chris, Christine Sexton who's the director of Kix in his presentation so I tweeted Christine Christine replies and then I used it as an icebreaker with Brian who I since seen at another conference and we now know each other so we're able to communicate as a result of that um, I did a tweet about a document repositories uh, thing I was discussing and I'm asked by the editor of the MMIT journal multimedia and information technology journal if I will write, write an article on the topic also myself and Claire create a short video promo for a conference and we're asked by the editor of a capital library magazine to write an article on the topic because they've seen our tweet so there's various people out there in the academic world in the clinical world are using this this is Trisha Greenhow you, you many of you may know she um, ha, is a very active tweeter she's tweeted over 5,000 times uh, you can see she's tweeting about the ref here and she's got just under 4,000 followers so when Trisha says something a lot of people pick up on it um, here is uh, something from the Higher Education Network from The Guardian just recently uh, a piece that they wrote called Twitter Peer Review and Alt Metrics: The Future of Research Impact Assessment so there's a general understanding out there within certainly these circles that there are new tools that are challenging the monopoly of impact factors um, now 
they still the jury is still out as to whether they can ever replace the ref. I think we're probably some way from that, but they can certainly supplement your output towards the ref, and there's potential there. These tools are not slowing down in their impact; they're actually growing. There's a lot of momentum. I've seen this for the last few years, certainly going back five, six years ago when we were looking at blogs, social networks. This is continuing to snowball relatively slowly, but now we're seeing some kind of a build-up with things like open access and um, such as such as the greater use of social media tools. There is very much the kind of belief out there in certain circles. One that I subscribe to is that in the future, and I'm talking the near future, there will be no such thing as media, only social media. Media will disappear as we know it. It will be all social media, and it's pretty much kind of coming to that day. Um, so, if you want to follow a discussion on this particular topic, altmetrics, if you if you join uh, Twitter and set up an account, if you hashtag that is put in a search for hashtag altmetrics, you can then see what people are talking about. Um, then we've got other things like social networks out there. Just to say, there's things like Mendeley, site you like, Connoteer, that are reference. Um, they're basically reference management kind of databases based on the web. Mendeley is also desktop bound, uh, but they have social networks. Mendeley has two million users, so you can use that to network with people. You can use it to follow papers, gain research, and also get your publications out there. Get people kind of looking at what you're kind of uh, writing and what you're publishing. Google Scholar, you'll have seen an email has just gone out around the school um, from the research committee um, advising people that they should set up a Google Scholar profile. We've been saying this for quite a while in information resource, and certainly myself and Claire. Um, as far as a year or so ago were running Google sessions and encouraging the staff who came along who were academic to set up their Google Scholar profile. There's such things as Scribd, which are document repositories, and F1000 posters out there. There are dozens of these sites that allow you to put your documents up there, providing you have the correct copyright clearance and your posters, and it just gets things further out in the web. Um, we live on this idea that people come and visit our websites, which they do, but you'd be very surprised by how many of our pages get so few results and so few hits. By getting them out there, you're going to where the people are and where the people are kind of operating. It's like having a shop, and if no one knows where the shop is, they're not going to come through the door. But if you go and put your shop in a busy high street or somewhere like a meadow wall, which is in effect one of these sites like a Mendeley or Google Scholar you're then getting people passing by so it's all about getting people into that shop window and here's an example of what Google Scholar looks like this is Mark Sanderson who's a professor of information retrieval from um, RMIT University Australia he used to work at the iSchool and he's got an awful lot of publications out there uh, as have a lot of people within our department and you can see it shows there how many people have cited cited him. You can click on that, see who cited, etc. It allows you to drill down via various things such as the co-authors, etc. And it shows you the citations by year. Google is particularly good at giving statistical evidence. Then there's things like LinkedIn, Google Plus. We've all got a Google Plus account in the university. You just need to activate it. Uh, ResearchGate and Scientific Networks. They're all social networks. Um, but on a professional basis, ResearchGate scientific networks are scientifically uh, academically based. LinkedIn is more of a professional, but has a lot of academics in there. But it's more in a terms of a private, uh, in the sort of like private domain and in uh, the the professional domains of of, of industry, etc. Pharmaceutical business is very big in there, so it's advisable to at least set up one or two of these accounts. You don't have to do a lot once you've got your content out there. It's not another kind of Tamagotchi pet that you've got to look after and nurture, but at least it gets another presence out there, and you can sometimes pick up traffic through these various things. And again, it's another way of showcasing your your abilities and your output. Uh, then we've got Mendeley. This is Andrew Booth's profile, so he's put all his uh, journal articles in there that he's published, and it's another way of people tracking them down, being able to search. Because this is a reference management database, it allows people to then add these references directly into their own database and potentially a lot of these people are researchers by nature within Mendeley will then start to write their own publications and they will have these references saved in their database potentially may cite them so there's there's this kind of uh, way of subterfuge of getting your publications into the people's consciousness by having them in such of these databases it's a great way to kind of improve your output then there's video 
Um, here's a video. I don't know if the sound will actually come through here, but this is a video uh, from uh, Research and Assistive Technology within Shaw. In ways that information and communication technology it's a very professional video, been made very professionally, um, but it's a very effective video of showing what we do in that particular department. Then there's people out there like this guy here, uh, Professor Mike Vetch from uh, from the US. He's a social anth anthropologist. Always struggle to say that, and he's created various videos out there. He's he's uh, won various prestigious academic awards and plaudits, and you can see from the top right hand corner that his videos have had 21 million views. This guy's an academic. He's not uh, a Gangnam dancer. He's not, he's he's not Justin Bieber. He is he is by essence a researcher. So you can see the amount of videos he can get. He's got 18,000 subscribers now. He is at very much at the top of his game, but he's using the video very much within the part of his work and. Uh, he will be reaping uh, rewards from that. Hello, for those of you that have already watched my video about bite size, then it's me again. Uh, for those of you that haven't, this is a video by Claire Beecroft, my colleague, who also co designed this presentation uh, with me. And this is a presentation she gave just to talk about what she was going to present at a conference. It's very informal, it's been recorded on a phone and uploaded very simply. A very effective way of communicating what she's going to talk about at the conference. So we've got lots of technology here. We've got things like Screencast-O-Matic. You can put that on your machine. It's totally free. We've got Camtasia on various machines, including the Mac in the library. And there's various other things such as Screener, which is free. We've got the iMac in the library that you can come in and record screencasts. You can edit them. We've got portable hardware out there. The Sony Bloggy, which is a little handheld video camera. Canon high definition video camera, which is uh, excellent with a tripod and external mic. And then you've got things like Windows Media Player, Uplayer, uh, which is the university video hosting site, YouTube. Everyone has a YouTube account here as part of your Google account. And Echo 360, which is the university's um, licensed screencasting and uh, lecture capture software that anyone can access provided they actually register uh, an account. Um, we've got audio recording software out there such as Audioboo. Audioboo is a fantastic piece of software that you can put on your um, uh, smartphone and it allows you to record yourself or the sounds around you. You can post boos to the Audioboo website and show them on social media platforms. You can use them to record anything. It's a great way to get ideas and thoughts out there even and, and even record just memos etc. Um, <clears throat> Audio is, is becoming increasingly pop popular, even though podcasts, etc., have been around for a long, long time. We're just starting to see evidence of various academic uses of this, such as reports, such as here, there's a report called the Value of Academic Libraries Report, and the author of this has uh, a, a, a two-way discussion with um, a interviewer as to the basic synopsis of, of what the report's about. So someone can listen to this. You don't have to trowel through pages and pages, read executive summaries, etc. Um, at a time when our attention spans are increasingly shortening, um, sometimes it's good just to focus on a bit of audio, perhaps put it on your on your smartphone, on your MP3 player, listen to it on the way to work. Um, so there's different ways of getting content out there. We've got things like Audacity, which is free recording and editing software. Anyone can download this. It's completely freeware. Uh, and it allows you to do excellent audio editing. So uh, I advise you to investigate that. It's fairly straightforward to use as well. Uh, visual. We've got lots of ways of getting visual. This is a Prezi that um, Claire has recorded as a screencast, but this is what Prezi looks like. It's a, it's this is the actual presentation I'm giving these on Prezi, so I perhaps so don't need to go into that too much. So, what is Prezi? There's also things like infographics. This is an infographic that Claire made. An infographic is a visual post. It's something that is is just tells you a, a story very simply. Um, infographics can be invariably more visual than this. They're usually by nature very very long their portrait usually sometimes you can get them landscape uh, and they use visuals to tell a story academically I can see these being used an awful lot more at conferences uh, we go to conferences we have these huge posters with tons and tons of text basically the article condensed into a poster and then we get people and we expect them to stand there and read them but the fact is people's attention spans are falling so I think personally the best way is to make attractive 
posters that give the core information there and if you're standing by the poster when someone comes and reads it they can get the supplementary information from handouts from the person speaking by links by QR codes on the posters that will take them to the pages where the published research is or the actual home page of the university or, or the actual author of the papers there's lots of ways we can get people through that kind of front door into the into the shop and start to kind of um, go on from there this is a poster that I created for um, ISPO in Berlin um, and it's it's not a complete poster as, as such time didn't allow me to kind of work on it anymore but it only took me a few hours and it's created just in PowerPoint um, but we we needed a list of, of conditions that heads kind of uh, do research in and I came up with the idea of turning it into sort of a London underground tube map uh, and it's a very simple way of showing what we do and you can see the various strands uh, are various conditions and, and their associated conditions in the same in the same areas um, so if we can think a little differently and create our post to be a bit more visual and a bit more interesting then potentially we can generate more interest in us and our work uh, this is a, a very good uh, there's lots and lots of good health based inf uh, informatics out there and this is one about the rise in type 2 diabetes among children and it's a really good way of just showing this particular problem uh, within this condition so not everyone can create these and unfortunately not even we can create these sometimes you've got to go to professionals who can do this but these, the tools are becoming more and more um, available out there people can now create their own infographics fairly fairly quickly and fairly simply and I think it's only a matter of time before this starts to explode and already I've seen that uh, such a site such as visually will now put you in contact with designers out there who can create posters for you uh, on, on the content that you've got so it's starting to connect people up um, this is a website called Altmetrics. If you go there and have a look at the various tools, there are lots of tools that are starting to appear. So with Altmetrics, you get something like this, which is a a, a paper, um, just like that. So here it is. That's what the paper looks like, and you can turn it into something like this. The same paper, and you can see how it's being used. You can see that 52 people here are saving it on on Mendeley. You can see that. Um, that uh, people are, are, are giving it Facebook likes, you've got a site you like, bookmarkers um, and various other ways that people have saved and shared this content even a Wikipedia mention down there. These are still fairly early days but I think that these may seem um, a tad novelty at this stage or or, or certainly um, um, sort of like not as professional as, as we may we may see in other methods but I think it's gaining leverage. These tools are starting to uh, become more and more commonplace. Um, this is something called Paper Critic, um, and it it allows the opening up of sort of like of the the peer review process. Again, it's another tool for you to perhaps go and have a look at. This is a um, um, a, a tool that this is the same tool that allows me to put in a paper. So I've put in this paper here, which is one from John Brazier and 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 Aki uh, and Jennifer Roberts, so all uh, University of Sheffield staff, or um, and um, it it's it has taken the the actual. Um, statistics and shown you by uh, various things such as the readers via discipline via the actual status there's there's more content actually if you look on the web base it can give you the location of where people are reading this and this is this is being done uh, using a, a Mendeley based tool so there are various tools out there still very early days but there's some interesting statistics starting to come out so you can start to see geographically who's taking an interest in your research other promotion tools, lots out there. Blogs are still very, very relevant. People start to say they would go away. There's still millions of blogs, and there's still hundreds of thousands that are very, very good and top quality, and certainly academic ones. Um, and we have a, we have a few in Shaw. We have uh, the Rats blog. We have the Shaw Library blog. We have the Heads blog. I think there's also a, a, an emergency medical care blog started. So there's lots and lots of content out there. Starting a blog is very simple. Anyone can do it. It doesn't take a lot to actually actually generate content believe it or not all you need is the actual content in the first place and the actual general kind of impetus to kind of go out and generate it if you can do it as a group then far more easier sites we can create Google sites if you're doing little projects make a little site to go with it just to promote that research get it out there um, sites only take a matter of hours to make 
SlideShare, very, very popular. Presentations go on SlideShare and they can get thousands and thousands of views very, very easily. So they're all free accounts. This is what a Google site will look like. This is the Shah Library Bite Size one. And this is a Google site for the American Educational Research Association Action Research Group. And um, this is the RATS blog quickly going through this because time is running out and this is a presentation I uploaded a couple of years ago four years ago onto SlideShare uh, and when I took the screen grab a few months ago it had 1600 views near on um, that's not many for SlideShare there's a lot of go out there that get tens of thousands there are a few that have had hundreds of thousands but for the actual time it takes uploading a uh, presentation which only takes a few minutes you then give people the ability to like it on Facebook to tweet about it to share it on LinkedIn to pin it to WordPress it to Google plus it you start to get it out there you can embed the presentation into a CMS page it starts to become very very uh, uh, adaptable and embeddable elsewhere uh, if you've got any questions just tweet me Andy underscore Tattersall or Beaky Beecroft, B E A K Y Beecroft. Uh, and that is the end. We're at 20, just over 20 minutes, and that was the Shar Bite Size for Research number 30 Alt Metrics Ways to Change the Impact of Your Research. Thank you and goodbye.